Place Matters report, I appreciate you bringing it up, was to think about what are place-based community level assets that we can build upon? So for areas in the city that have access to green space, how is that a benefit to us? What can we use that um, to be? You know, Is that our opportunity for outside mobile classrooms in this current climate? Um, thinking about, um, you know, are there access to benefits and other programs? Are there access to behavioral health services? We know that our nation is seeing unprecedented levels of depression and anxiety. So we really have to be thinking through not just an individual response as Aaron's talking about is what is a community level response? Mm -hmm. And we have to build on our strengths. Um, we can't just focus on the deficits all the time. We know that there are issues we have to address, but I'm sure just like you, when you have stressors in your own life and your family, you pull upon the things that you have to get through it. So for those of us that have a strong social support network um, that has the people who can come over and fix your car or get your house unlocked if you have someone with your key, you have that type of support. You might have support from folks that um, you can call and vent to and they're gonna help um, listen to you and maybe make you laugh. You have friends that you like to do things with, go on hikes, um, go outside. And so thinking through how do we strengthen communities based on community strengths, I think is really important. We know from the Place Matters maps and so many maps of Philadelphia that we have areas of our city that are struggling in different ways and in really critical ways. And so in Place Matters, we talked about the area of Kensington. It's not just an area that's struggling because of opioids. It's also the part of the city that has the most children living in it. Mm -hmm. So if we think about that, just to take a moment to say, we know that that requires a different set of outreach and uh, a different set of strategies because we have many families with children that are living in an environment that is strained and was strained prior to um, the pandemic, but then thinking about what does that look like now? Mm -hmm. And for the nonprofits and other community serving organizations, they're struggling, they're strained to try to meet the, the needs. But meanwhile, it's a community there. There are people there that are trying every day to do things. And so how do we build upon that? I wanna say that in terms of thinking about what we have to pay attention to, in addition to natural disasters, which is where I don't spend my time, um, thinking about, but I'm glad you do, um, <laughs> is thinking about, you know, how are we as a city and a nation going to reckon with the reality of racism in our city? And we have to think about that is a public health crisis. We have levels of violence, again, rising in unprecedented ways. We have young people who are not involved at all getting injured and even killed. And so I think we also have to take a step back and say, we are better than this. How can we build upon that? And I don't think we're gonna get there through incremental change. So I think really um, thinking about how do we be transformative? How do we be innovative? We are a city of first. Um, so how do we think about that? And yes, my, my comment on violence is both what we've seen by police um, and in our communities. We know that we have too many guns. Um, and so that that's a problem when you have too many guns, you have high levels of unemployment, you have high levels of stress and you have kids that are not in school. Um, and so all of those things are coming together in what we're seeing right now. And how do we build off um, our strengths to address those? Yeah. Earlier, um, you may have missed it. We, we referred to this trace project that we're involved in in generosity and the report card that we, um, that we issue just for some self-awareness and diagnosis of how well we think we're doing um, right now with everything that's happening in our city. So um, I don't know if you happen to, uh, if, if you missed it earlier, just anecdotally, uh, how do the two of you feel we're, you know, we're, we're behaving during this, uh, during this, this active recovery time that we're in right now? Well, I, I did miss the part earlier, so I would just have to, well, whatever categories it might have been in, I apologize. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. more expansively. Um, you know, I, I do go back to, uh, there's a housing crisis across the country that is felt most acutely um, in major cities. Um, so we, we need improvement on that um, because 
the the transition from a, a temporary shelter to uh, there's just really there there's very little out there not only in terms of the physical space for people to occupy but the resources and the financial assistance to actually be able to claim that space to move on um, that's a that's a huge need right now um, and I you know with to what Samantha was saying you know we see time and time again um, that it is the it's the most vulnerable communities. Um, that are going to be affected exponentially more by crises. Um, so making sure that people who are already on a precipice, um, that that's where you start to really triage your, your resources first um, and, and really pinpointing that because that's once you get behind on serving that, that at that level, you rare, very rarely catch up. Um, also making sure that languages are available. You know, in the, in the disaster world, we see... Um, the increased number of storms that are happening on the edges of our countries are causing populations to shift. So like, for example, Hurricane Maria, um, there was a lot of evacuations into from Puerto Rico into uh, New York, Philly, Chicago, all these major cities that are putting stressors on cities um, with increased population, increased um, language barriers, increased lack of documentation, you know, all of that stuff. So. Um, we, we need to be better um, as, uh, as cities to be able to accommodate that. Um, and then I think the other part too that we don't talk about enough, I, 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 my, my field within disaster is operations and logistics. So I'm the person that loves to talk about supply chain, um, mm. but we are, we are living in a very uh, vulnerable time for different elements of supply chain. So uh, whether that's, you know, the food supply chain, even like the recent uh, looting and riots, you know, we're, we're, we're having conversations with the state of, okay, oh, are there going to be food deserts that pop up inadvertently because trucks can't get to the stores and they were already not really being supplied with nutritious food and already having trouble having enough food in those areas? How will, the, you know, these activities exacerbate those things? Um, and then, you know, other aspects like the American Red Cross deals with a lot is uh, the pandemic really really kicked off a huge blood shortage in the country. Um, so it's, it's things like that, that um, I do think cities need to be aware of vulnerable communities and the resources that they're gonna need to, to support those communities. You know, we call it speed to market and speed to scale. Like how quickly can we identify and get those resources to the most vulnerable so that it stabilizes as fast as we can. And I don't think we're I don't think we're on the, the edge of that enough to be moving fast with that speed to market that we need to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to add, and I think it's so great to be paired with Aaron because we come from this from such um, yeah. <laughs> opposite places, um, which is great for you know interdisciplinary teaming on this. Um, so I will say that I first think what Philadelphia has going for is that look at all of you, like we have so many people who care and commit their lives and careers to making this place better. I think that that is important to recognize. We have so many nonprofits, we have amazing um, private sector organizations, we have an amazing behavioral health system, look at our Red Cross. So, you know, thinking about all of the things that we have, um, I want to say, and I know Scattergood was involved with the um, collection of the, the data in some ways, but I want to say that I love data. So I think it's always commendable to be collecting data um, and trying to get a pulse. What people are thinking is really important. That said, when I saw this, I, I laughed a little bit at the last question about people's own contribution to the effort, because in psychology, we, we my, my husband says psychology is a study of the obvious, but one of the things that psychologists study is that um, we tend to over-evaluate our own competencies and under-evaluate other people's. Mm -hmm. So if you ask about yourself or someone's kid, they'll say, oh yeah, they're above average. You know, they're, they're right. exceptional. Well, not everyone can be above average, right? So what we do is we say, well, yeah, that person's probably average. Um, and so I think just knowing that, and that's that's protective actually for our own well-being. So it's not a bad thing. Um, but we know when people are also working really hard, they are saying, yeah, I'm doing a good job. I'm working 50 hours, 60 hours a week on this. So I think one of the things then we have to ask ourselves is, effort doesn't always equal outcomes, unfortunately. 
Um, I don't debate that people in our school district are working incredibly hard right now to try to figure this out, but I don't think we're getting the outcomes that, that we're seeking right now. You know, looking at the data from the ventilation reports for the elementary schools was not surprising, but it's not okay that there are no to one classrooms that passed the air quality tests required for students for to return. And I think we have to ask ourselves, we could be working really hard, but what does that mean as a city with a large public education system that doesn't have quality air for our students? And because of the electrical challenges, they can't even be upgraded in some of the schools. And so, and, and as Aaron's saying, that's not equally distributed throughout our city. And I know where I live, we are blessed um, to be, I'm in Center City and our school parent um, HSA fundraised to replace the HVAC. Um, and so that's not an access that everyone has the ability to fundraise that way. So really thinking about that. I do think in looking um, at the trace um, report card have been looking at um, what um, areas, why do we think that there are certain strains there and really trying to unpack that. Um, I see that thinking about addressing chronic issues and structural changes were the things that were scored lowest in. And I think that's what we're saying here is that because we're putting band-aids um, and not addressing the thing that's cutting the person, that's what we're seeing, that we're becoming a very reactive city to these issues, but we really wanna stop the initial point of injury. Um, just like we learn in public health. And so I do think we have to take this more public health response, which thinks mm -hmm. about prevention and health promotion um, first, which again, our city was one of the leaders to figure out fire departments mm -hmm. and moving away from privatization of services so that everyone could benefit if your house was on fire. Um, and I just wanna say, yes, Lee, thank you so much for your um, contributions and the work that you're doing to really highlight the structural issues that are happening in our, in our schools that impact all of us, right? Because we can't go back to work until our kids are in school, right? right. So I have a four and seven year old home with me today and I'm so thankful they are being quiet. Um, but that's the reality right now. And I'm so fortunate to have a job where I can stay home um, but yeah. for many families are really struggling to balance all of those things. And so mm -hmm. I, I love that you endeavored on the data collection. I think we should continue to do that. And we need to amplify the voices of people we're not hearing from, because that's really who I'm most concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a, uh, I'm glad you're talking about it. And just also know Samantha in the, when we, in the disaster world, when we open up shelters, um, you know, large responses, whatever it might be. One of the first questions we always ask partners are, when's the school reopening? It's like a, it's this internal litmus for us that stability is brought back to a community when kids can start going back to school. It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's other things, there's so many other things happening, but like, when do the kids get to go back to school? Cause then the parents, you know, there's just, yeah, I'm sure it goes without saying, but it's just interesting that on, again, that micro and that macro scale, <laughs> that it's, it's very similar. Yeah. Um, we're, we're very interconnected, interrelated, yeah. world, right. That's, that's yeah. what we, we know now. And, and we know that technology is able to help us, mm -hmm. um, but we can't substitute kids being in classrooms and with peers and, um, that's something that we, mm -hmm. ha we have to face. And for us as adults, this isn't sustainable either, right? To be staring at a screen um, indefinitely. Yeah. So, you know, thinking about what that, that looks like too. Yeah. And I apologize for interrupting a bit and shifting back. I saw that there was someone named Samantha who oh, I'm asked me, or no, I'm, you're Samantha. I'm so sorry. What? Sabrina. <laughs> I knew it was an S name. I'm sorry. Sabrina had asked me a question related to something I said about the the migrations after disaster and documentation. And I, I just wanted to quickly make sure I address that question um, and you know, answer it however I can, you know, uh, when what we are seeing from these migrations from, from major storms, which this year was a doozy. Um, this, uh, we've done a couple uh, preemptive cost analysis for this year's uh, hurricane and wildfire season. And we do believe it's actually gonna go over a billion dollars, um, which is, uh, is a lot. It's, I mean, it's a lot objectively and uh, the American Red Cross does not normally uh, spend a billion dollars on a season. So, um, so we're seeing an uptick in storms and 
the documentation that I always recommend people, uh, citizenship is not typically questioned that, you know, of course, Puerto Rico, um, all of that, they are American citizens, but so many documents are destroyed in disasters. And the things that we have found most recently in the last, you know, handful of years with, um, with people from any part of the United States is um, they lose their, their uh, paperwork around their Medicare and their Medicaid. And that is incredibly hard to to navigate quickly. It is, you can navigate it, but it's really slow. And when people need medicine, they need it right now, you know? Um, and then just even pre-disaster address, having something maybe you, sh you just save in an email that you can pull up somewhere to show, um, to show that, to show that address that can be one of those things that's lost. So it really has, it's, it's the simple stuff that we don't remember to maybe email ourselves so that when you do get somewhere safe, you can pull that up um, mm -hmm. that really kind of set the foundation for you to have access to resources in the future. So, um, but yeah, especially the, the housing and the, and the medicine, those are the big things that we've seen in the last couple of years that are just excruciatingly slow to navigate if people lose that documentation. Yeah. So we've got uh, just a few minutes left here and I um, want to just ask this last question for you both. Um, what's something that we can do today, like right now, like we leave this Zoom and do what? That both responds to 2020 and helps us build some resiliency for the future. I think for me, um, knowing some of you all in, in this room and not others is to think about what resources do you have, not talking about money, um, that aren't currently being used. And so mm -hmm. do you work in an office building that's not being used right now, but might be um, really high quality? Like how do we think about using these spaces? Um, do you have transportation vehicles? Do you have extra modems? I don't know, like what are the things that do you have that we could think more creatively about using right now? Because I think what we see is that this isn't going away soon. You know, I'm hopeful we're on a good path, um, but with numbers surging, you know, as they are, um, we're gonna take a long time to recover from this. And so how do we think out of the box? How do we try something we haven't tried before um, to bring our resources together? So could we think about students going into the Airmark building, right? They're empty. Mm -hmm. How do we think about these beautiful buildings in our city to become places for our kids? Um, so that's just one idea, but I'm sure all of you have your, your own, but really thinking more at a kind of community population response, what are assets that are not currently being utilized that could be? Yeah. Great. Yeah, mine would be similar in the sense of um, think very locally, um, what networks are available on that local level um, that bring together those resources. You know, do you know your neighbors? Do you know your civic associations? Do you know your whatever church network might be available that is maybe in place, but fledgling and could use that support to really make that strong? Because in those initial days of a response and then in the long-term recovery aspect of, you know, at least the language that we use in my world, um, we always start things at the local level. We reach out to those local fire departments, those local, those local agencies, like what do we know? What resources are available and how can we augment and, and bring in what's missing from that local network? You know, we always want to be a complement to the local, the local plan, you know, but if, pla if places don't have a local plan, I would say we as citizens need to be more proactive in building these little, you know, these networks of things because broad overall agencies, I mean, I'm very grateful and proud of of serving for the American Red Cross, but we cannot do the work we do without having the pods of communities come together and fill in all those gaps of resources. That's great. Well, thank you both for uh, contributing to the conversation today. As promised, viewers, we're gonna go into our breakout sessions to continue the conversations in smaller groups. So uh, stay tuned as Ayana hooks us up and, and gets us to our destinations. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Aaron, for Ooh. joining. And, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Stick around for a little bit. Have today. a good morning, guys. Nice to meet you, Samantha. <laughs> you too.